Thanks so much, Nami, and good morning, everyone. It's really good to see you here and to be with you. And isn't that a wonderful, wonderful passage that we have this morning, where John the Baptist, he sees Jesus and he says, look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so this morning, I want to talk about Jesus, the Saviour of the world, I wonder, what's the best thing that you have ever seen? Maybe right now you're thinking of a great sunset or a great movie or a great painting. We've got three kids, and so for me, it was definitely that moment of seeing their little newborn faces for the very first time. Owen, my husband, and I work with postgrads, and one of the wonderful postgrads that we work with is called Rob. Rob studies robotics. I'm not even kidding. Um, it's not an essential requirement that your name has to match your uh, postgraduate study. Uh, but Rob studies robotics. And he was telling me that one of the best things that he's ever seen is the correspondence algorithm that identifies consistencies between two feature sets using the elements of the principal eigenvector of the compatibility, compatibility matrix. I literally have no idea what any of that means. Uh, but I think that Rob has seen, well, the best thing he's seen is some cool codes to do with robots and stuff. But robotics or not, we've all had, haven't we, that moment where we see something or we come to understand something or a particular moment happens in our lives where suddenly something is different. Maybe even significantly different. And we are changed. This moment in our passage this morning in John's Gospel is one of those. John the Baptist, he sees Jesus. And the language of our passage kind of captures the significance with, look, behold, I have seen. You see, here is the one who has come to deal with the brokenness of our world, with the hurt. Here is the one who has stepped into human history to save us, to put things right. Because we can see, can't we, that the world around us is not as it should be, and we are not as we should be, but there is a God who in Jesus has stepped in to put us right and to put this world right, and John says, look, here he is, he's come. And now this is a huge claim this morning, and this is a momentous moment here in our passage, and this huge claim and this momentous moment, this shapes all that's going on here this morning. This shapes all of our lives, this momentous moment of Jesus coming and what follows in the gospel account of his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, the coming of the spirit of Pentecost. All of this shapes all that we are as a church here, our mission, our vision, what we do, the stories that we hear like Nathan's this morning. This momentous moment shapes our lives and flows out from us into our work in the cities, into where we live, in our communities, into our neighborhoods. And so this passage invites us this morning, whether we're new to all of this or whether we've been walking with Jesus for a long time, to look again, to see Jesus again this morning, to have this momentous moment, this key moment shape ever more who we are becoming as we look at him. Script writers and filmmakers sometimes apparently create something called a wham episode or a wham shot. We've got some people in the church here who are filmmakers. Maybe they know about these things. And this is where there's like a particular episode, maybe you watch box sets and you kind of know what I'm talking about, where after that episode or after that specific shot, like nothing is ever the same again. The French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was into kind of candid photography, he uh, came up with this term for that same moment in photography. In fact, he wrote a book on it and he called it the decisive moment. Well, how all of a sudden something can kind of shift in a photographer's view, and that there, that is the decisive moment. Here in our passage this morning, John captures the decisive moment, and he wants us to capture it too. Look, here he is. He's the one who has come because he loves us. And so firstly, in our passage this morning, we're invited to look and see Jesus come to us. Verse 29, 
maybe you've got your Bibles there with you, have a look with me, says the next day John saw Jesus coming towards him. I love this. I love this detail. You know, John sees Jesus coming towards him. Maybe we think that we go looking for God, but even more true than that is that God comes looking for us. God comes looking for you. You know, God is looking for you this morning. God is looking for me this morning, and we're some of the very best things that he's ever seen. Jesus comes towards John the Baptist. Jesus comes towards you. Jesus comes towards me. You might have heard the opening of this gospel of John, perhaps at Christmas time in a carol service, where it starts with this declaration that the word was with God, the word, the logos, the eternal word, Jesus Christ revealing God. He was with God in the beginning. He was God. And then there's this decisive moment in verse 14 where it says, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. You see, this reminds us that our God isn't distant from the world. Our God doesn't kind of look on and say, oh dear, you know, that's a bit of a mess over there. No, our God gets stuck in. Our God in Jesus comes into our world because he loves us. Elsewhere, you know, perhaps in philosophy or culture or psychology or society, you know, they might suggest that we can find true fulfillment or happiness or contentment in various different things. And there may be some general wisdom in some of those observations. But often we find that in those things, the onus is on us. It's up to us to make a shift here, to make a change there, to do this, to shift this in our lives. But the gospel of Jesus is so very different. God takes the initiative. Jesus, says John the Baptist here in John 1, walks towards him. Jesus comes towards John the Baptist, and John the Baptist in our passage sort of has this disclaimer in verse 33. I wouldn't have known, he says. He's reflecting and highlighting that he's just on the wonderful receiving end of God's initiative, of God walking towards him and Jesus, of God's amazing calling and purpose and vision for his life. You see, before we're able to fix ourselves or sort our game out or smarten ourselves up, the God who loves us, the God who knows us, the God who gives us purpose, he's come towards us. He's come into the world. He has, says this passage walks towards us. He doesn't look the other way this morning. No matter what the mess of our lives, he looks directly at us because he loves us. He loves you. He loves me. Several years ago, uh, here at the church, I was helping out with Alpha, and um, on my table there were these two brothers. They were mechanics. They were on a placement year uh, here in Oxford. They were great fun. We had such a laugh on our table. I remember it really well. And we particularly had a fun time because there was this one week where something happened that we laughed about, something unexpected happened that we laughed about for weeks to come. We were just sat sort of here in the middle of the church on a table, and uh, one of the brothers said, you know, I find it hard to believe in God. If I was God, I'd make myself more obvious. And the other brother said, yeah, absolutely. Like, I totally agree. And just as he said that, there was a power cut in the entire church and all the lights went out. I'm not kidding. It was a a moment, maybe a decisive moment. It wasn't long that we were in the darkness because then the lights came back on. But we had the most amazing conversation then about Jesus about how here he is. He is the God who has made himself obvious to the world. We talked about how we have these reliable recorded evidence here in the Gospels, documents about his life, how he said stuff that no one had ever said. He did stuff that no one had ever done and how he is the light of the world, Jesus. And without him, we dwell in darkness. Where this morning do you need the God who comes towards you to shine his light in your life? What do you need him to walk towards this morning? Because he will walk towards your financial struggles. He will walk towards your relational difficulties. He will walk towards your doubts and your questions if you let him. Look, Jesus coming towards us, taking the initiative. God in a person because he loves us. In 2012, 
I guess I particularly needed to look at Jesus again. I hadn't stopped following him. I hadn't stopped believing that in him alone was life and life in all its fullness. I was working a really demanding job teaching English in a secondary school. And I was also at the same time training to be a teacher. So I was getting up really early. I was staying up really late, planning lessons, marking essays, writing my own essays for my course, going to London to study as well. And I guess I was just pretty spent and tired and weary It wasn't easy for me to find time to be with Jesus. And my kind of prayer life had become increasingly dry. And then there was this one Wednesday where it was the monthly gathering that we have here um, for prayer and worship in the church. And this one Wednesday in 2012 where I sort of walked in. And you know one of those moments where you don't realize how much you need Jesus until you realize how much you need him. And I came in and we were singing about who Jesus is. And I closed my eyes and I started to pray and I felt the Holy Spirit really close to me, just sat over there by the pillar. And I was overwhelmed afresh by looking at Jesus come to me, his beauty, his glory, his love, his mercy, his justice, his majesty, the purpose that he gives me and each of us if we trust in him. And in that moment, I guess God did something decisive in me. And I realized just how much I'd been carrying on my own to get through. And I didn't need to do that anymore. So I took a fresh look at Jesus. You know, we can have those particular moments like I did then. I could tell you the exact date. I could tell you more details about that moment. But actually, we are to look again at Jesus coming towards us at every moment of our lives to see him afresh each day as we read his word, as we read the scriptures, as we encounter him, as we pray, as we remember him, as we take bread and wine, as we meet together as his people, as we, just before we go into a meeting at work, we say, God, I know you're with me. Would you help me? Or just before we have a tricky conversation, we say, Jesus, I want to look to you so that I can be like you when I talk to this person. Look at him walking towards you today with you in your work, with you in your community, with you in your neighborhood. And secondly, in this passage, we look at Jesus meet our deepest need. Verse 29, John the Baptist says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then he goes on here in the passage in verse 30 to say, This is the one I meant when I said a man who comes after has surpassed me because he was before me. He's talking there about Jesus as eternal, always existing. And then verse 32, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a, um, as a dove and remain on him. He's talking about how Jesus there is the anointed one. Jesus can be the one who meets our deepest need. Jesus is the savior of the world because he is the eternal one, promised for all time for us, and he is the anointed one through whom God works out his purposes. What does John the Baptist mean when he says lamb of God? The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And just before this moment, this decisive moment, John the Baptist is chatting with the Jewish religious leaders, the priests and the Levites. We can see that here in our passage in verses 19 and 20. And they are the ones who knew God with them. We can read of their story, the Israelites in the Old Testament in the Bible. They knew God with them. They knew that he had set them free from slavery. They knew that their deepest need was to know connection and intimacy and relationship with the God of it all, the God who loved them, the creator God in whom they had this promised covenant relationship. And so as a people, the Israelites had practices and language for around when things happened that broke that connection of intimacy with a perfect, good, and holy God. They had moments and practices like bringing animal and grain offerings or cleansing practices to acknowledge the guilt and the shame that they knew within their hearts that sort of disconnected them from the God who is perfect and holy. And so each day, perhaps they would bring a lamb as an offering to atone for their sin. Or once a year, 
the high priest, but only him, on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur, would go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood. Or at Passover, they would remember how the blood of the Lamb was on the doorposts of the Israelites so that they would be delivered from death. But all throughout the pages of the Old Testament is this thread that, yes, there were these means at one point, but actually God would provide in time another means, which would do away with these temporary practices. And this is what is going on here in this decisive moment when John the Baptist says, look, here's the lamb. Here's the perfect lamb who's slain for our sin. Here's the one who comes to make us righteous. Here's the one who, through his death on the cross brings us into the very presence of God. Not just one people group at one time, but all the world who would believe in him. Here is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who is risen from the grave to deliver us from the threat of death so that we can be forever now and for all time in the presence of the Father who loves us. See the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and who meets our deepest need. A few years ago, one of my theology lectures was on sort of urban mission, and it was from a vicar who spent a lot of his time in places of uh, urban priority areas, and he was telling us about this one time where the church that he was in, in a kind of city centre estate, uh, not a wealthy church, but this church had inherited a life-size porcelain Victorian nativity scene. So every Christmas, this life-size Victorian porcelain (laughs) nativity scene would be in the entranceway of the church. And not long before Christmas, this vicar, he had a phone call from the church warden. I imagine sometimes those are a little scary. And uh, he answered the phone and the warden of the church said, really sorry, vicar, but we've got a bit of a problem. The life-size baby Jesus is missing. And the vicar sort of intuitively knew exactly what to do. And he made a walk to the small flat of one of the locals who I'll call Francis. And he went to her house and he knocked on the door and he said, Hi, Francis. She opened the door, just slightly revealing behind her the chaos of her flat. And the vicar said to her, Francis, we've got a problem. I wonder if you can help me. The thing is, is in this situation, we we, we do actually have to call the police, but I think you can maybe help me. The baby Jesus from the nativity scene is missing. And then she opened the door fully, showing behind her piles of soiled clothes, mess and chaos, stuff piled up everywhere, but then gestured to a sofa where she'd laid out a pristine white cloth. And on it, sure enough, was the baby Jesus. And she turned to the vicar and she said, you see, the thing is, vicar, I had to have him. He's all I've got. And Francis's gesture in that moment was saying, here is the one who meets my deepest needs. Here is the one who fulfills me. Here is the one who I can bring into the mess of my life. Not a life-size porcelain baby Jesus, but the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who is with us today by his Spirit, the one who stepped into human history, Jesus Christ. Look at him afresh, meeting your deepest needs, taking away the guilt, the shame, bringing you into all that God would have for you, entering into the mess of your life, Not keeping at a distance, but right there in the midst of it. You see, if Jesus alone is the one who meets our deepest needs, then always, for the rest of our lives, he is the one who will meet our needs. It's not like we have this decisive moment at one point and we welcome him in and then for the rest of the time we sort of turn to other places or to other needs or to other other directions. No, every point of our lives, in the trials in the struggles, in the suffering, in the hopes, in the happiness, in our work, in our communities. Jesus is the one to bring in. Jesus is the one to go to first. Jesus is the one who meets our deepest need. And every other need that we will have, he is the one who can meet that fully and truly. And thirdly, 
we're invited in this passage to look at Jesus and tell our story. So we look at Jesus come towards us. We look at Jesus meet our deepest need. And then finally, we look at Jesus and tell our story. We can see that here at the end of this passage. This is kind of the way that the passage moves forward. It ends in verse 34 with John the Baptist saying, I've seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. You see, John the Baptist sees Jesus and then he wants to speak of Jesus. John the Baptist encounters Jesus and then he wants to go share about Jesus. John the Baptist has a fresh look at Jesus and he wants other people to be brought into the goodness and the fullness of life in him. And in fact, this is the kind of whole direction of this Gospel of John, written by a different John to John the Baptist. But he ends in this Gospel by saying, all of this stuff, I've recorded all of this so that you might believe in Jesus and have life in his name. In my first week uh, of uni, I met someone called Charlotte. She was a fresher, like me. She wasn't on the same course as me. She was studying music. She actually went on after uni to work in the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden in London. And I met her in that first week. And I also met someone called Bryony. And uh, Bryony, like me, arrived at university as a follower of Jesus. And Bryony and I got stuck into the church here at St. Aldate's, came along to student night, came along on Sundays. And Charlotte, as we got to know her, she became more and more intrigued about our faith, more and more intrigued about why we were making the choices we were making, more and more intrigued about who this Jesus was that we spoke about as our saviour. And so Charlotte started coming along here to church with us as well. And in February of our first year at uni, Charlotte gave her life to Jesus. And I was chatting with her uh, the other day, and she put in a text message a little bit of her story. She said this, I heard talks in that time in February and January that persuaded me that Jesus was a real historical figure who really said and did these things. She wrote, that was a bit scary, as it felt like if it was true, I needed to respond. I then remember hearing the prodigal son passage from Luke and being blown away by the compassion of the father I didn't realize God was like that. And then the speaker invited me to pray, asking Jesus to be Lord of my life. It felt scary, but I knew I needed a savior. I'd gone so far, I realized I couldn't go back now to how things were. I could see now only Jesus could be that savior. And then Charlotte started coming more and more to church here. She started bringing people from her course. She had seen, she had looked at Jesus as her savior and she wanted others to see him too. And 15 years on, Charlotte is now working in a church plant in the center of London, spending her time inviting other people to come and encounter the Jesus that gave her ultimate purpose and meaning and life and hope and peace. Maybe it was 15 years ago that you had a decisive moment, that you looked and you saw Jesus, the Savior of the world. Maybe it was 15 months ago. Maybe it was 15 days ago. Maybe it was 50 years ago. Will you look at him afresh this morning? See him for who he is in all of his beauty, in all of his love for you. See him firstly come towards you. See him secondly meet your deepest needs as he sets you free, as he offers you forgiveness from sin, as he sets you on a path to life eternal. And then will you share him, tell your story, having seen him just like John the Baptist here? Will you testify, will you tell of, will you speak of his goodness? Amen.